there isn't a whole lot that hasn't been said about AMD's entry-level Athlon 200 GE. For 55 US dollars, you get yourself a 3.2 GHz 2-core, 4-threaded Zen-based CPU, along with entry-level Vega 3 graphics. All in all, it's quite the performer for the cost. As far as Vega 3 goes, there's no shortage of great content showing the graphical performance in newer games. The summation thus far is Vega 3 holds its own in newer titles at 720p with low-ish settings. Well, one of the topics I've been pondering as of late is how well would Vega 3 hold up against a handful of older ATI GPUs in DirectX 9 and 10 games? It's a rather interesting question and one I hope to answer today. But before we show you today's contenders and all the benchmarks, we need to put together a test bed. So let's take a look at the parts and get this baby assembled. Starting things off is the motherboard. And I chose the GAAB350N Gaming Wi-Fi board from Gigabyte. It has all the features you'd want from an ITX board in this price range, including wireless AC. It's also nice to see with the latest BIOS update, we now have the ability to unlock the multiplier, which does enable overclocking on the 200GE. For the system memory, I purchased a used kit of G-Skill 3200MHz DDR4. This kit has a cast latency of 16, and it's definitely overkill for this little guy, as support is limited to 2066MHz. FSP was kind enough to send me one of their 500W gold-rated flex PSUs for this build, and it's definitely one of the better flex options out there. Again, it's overkill for the testing today, but I do plan to put it to good use in the future. As much as it makes sense to install an M.2 drive in this system, I didn't have an extra one, so I used my SanDisk Ultra 2 480GB SSD. Cramming a 2.5 inch SSD into this case can be a little difficult, especially when installing a small form factor GPU. Now, speaking of the case, I was contacted by Velk Case to look at their new ITX Velka M. This little guy comes in at 4 liters and is one of the few cases on the market that supports an internal flex PSU, a dual slot small form factor GPU, and chassis fans. This case also comes with mesh side panels that are attached via magnetic tape, and while it may look a little rough, they are the key component for maintaining excellent CPU and GPU temperatures. For this build, I also picked up a pair of Cooler Master low profile 80mm fans and an easy DIY PCIe 3.0 flexible cable. Now, the PCIe flex cable isn't the correct spacing, so I wasn't able to screw both ends into the case, and this did cause some issues with a single slot GT1030 that I just installed for show. However, with a dual slot card, it shouldn't be an issue. Well, now that we've shown you all the parts used in today's build, Let's get on with putting it all together.
All right, now that it's work complete, let's take a look at today's contenders. Starting things off is the HD 2600 XT. This is one of the faster 2600 XTs with a core clock of 772 MHz and 256 MB of GDDR4. A 512 MB variant would perform better, but let's not pretend the 2600 XT is actually fast. Next up is the HD 3870, and I've tested this card a couple of times on my channel, and it's back again to strut its stuff. The 3870 fixed a lot of the issues that plagued the 2900 XT, all while retaining the same levels of performance. This card comes equipped with 320 stream processors, 512 megabytes of GDDR4, and it also supports DirectX 10.1, but we won't be utilizing that today. Now let's take a look at the HD 4850, and this card features the best form of Terascale 1.0. It includes 800 stream processors, and this 4850 is one of the later release variants that has a full one gigabyte of GDDR3. It also comes clocked at 700 megahertz with a TDP of 110 watts. The 4890 features the same 800 stream processors as the 4850, but with some slight tweaks to the silicon featuring three million additional transistors. The real difference here is the inclusion of GDDR5, which equates to nearly double the memory bandwidth of the 4850. On top of this, the core clock is much higher, coming in at 850 megahertz. Last but not least is the star of the show, and that's Vega 3. It's based on the Vega architecture, obviously, which is the fifth generation of GCN. It supports 4K, DirectX 12, Vulkan, and comes packed with 192 stream processors clocked up to 1 thousand megahertz. Do note that during all of my benchmarking, clocks did stay pegged at 1000 megahertz the entire time. Memory bandwidth is tied to the system memory and VRAM is dynamically allocated thanks to Windows 10. At this point you might be asking yourself, how the heck does he plan to stuff a full length dual slot GPU into this tiny case? Well, that happens to be the ace up the Velka M sleeve. Spending $2 on the extended length standoffs, I was able to extend the length of the case to accommodate these larger cards. And while this Decepticon may not be the prettiest option, it will allow users to keep their existing GPUs while transitioning over to everything suitable for ITX. Now before I jump into the benchies, a couple of things I uh, want to keep in mind here in today's testing. Older ATI GPUs have to contend with Windows 10 and legacy display drivers. So in newer games, we'll see zero performance optimizations along with inconsistent frame times and non-existent bug fixes. On the other hand, with older games and synthetics that were optimized to run well on Terascale, we should see decent performance. And with Vega 3, the story is pretty much the opposite. This little guy thrives in Windows 10 and has support for the latest and greatest drivers from AMD. It's hard to say for sure, but I doubt there are any performance optimizations for older titles, even though this is GCN. So with that being said, let's jump into it. And the first game up is Fear. Now this game was definitely a system killer back in 2005, and here I chose to max the game completely out at 1080p. Now we can see Vega 3 averages 44 frames per second during the run of the built-in benchmark, and that's only a tick behind the 3870, but the 4850 ends up being 95% faster, and the HD 4890 is 177% faster. Ouch. Now, frame times look rough on all the cards, especially over the water section of the benchmark, but this is a rough start for, uh, for little Vega. Now it's time to benchmark 2007 system killer, Crisis. I tested this game at 1080p using the medium preset and used the assault time demo to get our numbers. And here we can see the Vega 3 slightly outperformed the HD 3870, but the 4850 ends up being 20% faster, while the 4890 drives ahead performing 40% faster. Unfortunately, frame times are lackluster on all of the cards tested. We're moving on to the original Metro Last Light, and I used the built-in benchmark and tested the game with low quality settings at 720p. Now Vega 3 is nipping at the heels of the 4890, which is only 8% faster in this title. While Vega 3 did perform well, frame times are not looking that hot, as shown by the numbers. Not much to say about the 2600 XT other than, uh, you know, it's, it's really slow. Next up is CSGO, and I benchmarked this game using the community-made benchmark that uses smoke that sends FPS straight to hell. 
Now I use low settings throughout at 1080p and Vega 3 slapped around the 3870 by 43% while the 4850 beats the little Vega down by 28%. The 4890 sits pretty fat and happy up top, killing it at 120 frames per second on average. Now frame times are kind of poop when using this workshop benchmark, but they drastically improve during actual gameplay. Rocket League is up and I'm using the replay option to capture my terrible gameplay and to obtain consistent results. 1080p using quality settings allows Vega 3 to produce 50 frames per second on average, soundly beating the 3870 by 19%, but it's getting smashed by the 4850 and 4890 by 10 and 40% respectively. Frame times were not too shabby for the TerraScale based cards, but there were a couple issues with Vega 3. If you've ever tried to play this next game with any of these TerraScale cards at 1080p, then you know they struggle a wee bit. Now I've used the last portion of the built-in benchmark along with normal settings using DirectX 10, and Vega 3 put the hammer down. Not only does it beat the 4890 by 17%, but frame times look heavenly next to the other guys. Not a bad showing for little Vega. Also, you might be wondering what's going on with the HD 2600 XT here, and uh, you're reading it correctly, so definitely recommend you picking up this card if you want to play GTA 5. The last game in our test suite is Fortnite. This is the only game in our roundup that Vega 3 is using a different API than the other cards tested. I tried to force DirectX 10 but had no luck, so Vega 3 is using DX11 in this title. That being said, Vega 3 does come out on top in average FPS and frame times. Now I did use the replay option to capture consistent results, but keep in mind during actual gameplay, frame times on all the cards are definitely a bit worse, especially at the start of the game and in areas that has a lot of players. Now that I'm done with all the games, let's take a look at the results for all seven titles tested and see how Vega 3 stacks up. Well, versus the 2600 XT Turtle Edition, we can see the Vega 3 is 277% faster. Aha. Uh -huh. It's also 37% faster than the HD 3870. And moving on to the HD 4000 series cards, we can see the 4850 beat Vega 3 by 10%, and the 4890 just put a slap down on it by 40%. I did test a couple of older synthetic benchmarks, starting with 3D Mark 06. Now using the default settings, you can see Vega 3 beats up the 3870 by 7%, but the beefy 4850 takes the lead by 4%, and the even beefier 4890 distances itself by 27%. Next up is Unigen Valley, and we use the DirectX 9 basic preset to get our scores. This benchmark chewed up and spit out Little Vega. The 3870 is 11% faster, and the 4850 is 63% faster, while the 4890 is 109% faster. Not a very good showing here. Power consumption is one area that Vega 3 really shines. Again, I used Unigen Valley, but this time it was used to gather power consumption figures at the wall. And as you can see, the entire system using Vega 3 is only consuming 57 watts, while the majority of the other cards are using well over 100. As you saw in the gaming results, the HD 4850 is only 10% faster overall, yet it uses 100% more power, and that's pretty interesting to see. All right, well that pretty much wraps up my testing today, but you might be asking yourself, why didn't he include NVIDIA cards in the roundup? Well, to answer that question, I tried. But I did run into a lot of issues using this platform, most of which was constant freezing. I spent a couple of nights troubleshooting and researching, but in the interest of time, I decided to drop them. Now I do plan to revisit this type of testing with DX11 cards in newer titles, and maybe do some CPU comparisons as well. Anyway, it's obvious where Vega 3's strengths lie, and older games from the mid-2000s isn't one of them. I would say DX9 performance as a whole isn't great, but CSGO and Rocket League performance is not half bad. The Vega 3 really starts to stretch his legs again in GTA 5 and Fortnite, and these are popular titles, so driver optimizations are there. Power consumption is definitely interesting, though we have to keep in mind the HD 4800 series came out in the middle of 2008, so this type of performance per watt is kind of expected in my mind. Anyway, I've had quite a bit of fun testing the Athlon 200GE, and I look forward to playing with it some more. I did also want to mention that I'm happy with how the build turned out, but I did run into one issue with the 24-pin connector installed. The clip that holds the connectors together 
touches the fan hub on one of the Cooler Master low profile fans, which in turn prevents it from spinning. So unless you're willing to shave or cut the clip a little bit, that fan will not be used with this motherboard. I also take a little issue with the side panels as they're just made of mesh and attach in kind of a clunky way. I love to see a metal frame type of panel that has mesh in the center. That way you have some solid panels along with the airflow benefits of mesh. I think the price is very reasonable though, coming in at only 59 US dollars plus 15 US dollars for shipping. For a case this small using high quality materials, I say the price is pretty darn good. I'll link the case and all the components in the video's description if you'd like to take a look. All right, people, well, that wraps up another video. For those of you who are new to the channel, please consider subscribing. And as always, thanks for taking the time to watch the video.